Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our group reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. In this 27th lecture, we will move on to the section of the text formerly titled Little B, Faith and Pure Insight. Now, given that by this phase of the phenomenology, we are actually working with determinate historical periods, just as the first um, section, uh, broadly speaking, of spirit was ancient Greece and then ancient Rome, this second broader set of phases within spirit is early modern France, and in particular, by this um, section, we uh, meet the 17th and 18th century debate in France between faith and reason, and we meet the historical figures representing each of Pascal and Voltaire. Now, it's interesting, if you think about it, that um, Pascal represents faith rather than reason in this debate, um, given that he was one of the great mathematicians of that century, but um, Pascal's wager really does give you something like a rational justification for why reason alone really is not good enough to rely on when you're dealing with something like your happiness, let alone your eternal happiness, as Kierkegaard would also mention, um, and as we will discuss later on in this lecture. At any rate, if you're not familiar with Pascal's wager, it basically argued on probabilistic grounds alone that the outcome, ultimately, of either choosing to believe in God so by knowing that, in a certain sense, it might not be true, versus um, choosing not to believe in God, despite knowing that that also might not be the right position, are um, disproportionate to one another. For example, if you choose to believe in God only to find later, in a certain sense, um, that he doesn't exist, well, the worst bad thing that happens to you is simply that you're wrong on an intellectual level, which is really not that big of a deal. On the other hand, if you choose not to believe in God, but then find out after you die that he really did exist all along, the worst bad thing that can happen to you is an eternity of damnation and suffering in hell, which is even worse than death. Keep in mind, Jordan Peterson notes that um, you do process the world psychologically in a strict binary of good and bad values. They do not make up a smooth continuum because we have this hermeneutical understanding that um, the, uh, the bad things um, really are um, continuous with the worst bad thing of all, which is for all of us the same, which is death. Whereas the best good thing is something each of us has a different personal interpretation of, because really, ultimately, the best good thing will only make you a little bit happier, which is disproportionate with um, the seriousness of what the worst bad thing could do to you. This is why um, many psychologists have um, noted and tried to understand why exactly it is that um, negativity sticks out in your memory a lot more than positivity. Um, I was, I remember attending um, a conference where um, a woman from Australia who happens to be living here in India um, noted a, sort of a warning to the students there that um, in the olden days if you were applying for a job they'd look at your resume your work history now really if you apply for a job they look at your social media account and um, it's interesting that even if they meet you and spend some time with you that's totally positive if they find just one post on social media that was negative um, that will negate everything positive they had um, thought about you from that impression of really meeting you in person. And the question why negativity sticks out in your mind more is for the um, secular naturalist psychologist, of course, that it's continuous with the worst bad thing of death. But for Pascal, that's not the worst bad thing. The worst bad thing is hell. And therefore, on rational grounds alone, um, you're much better off believing in God than not believing in God, says Pascal. But of course, in this video, we're going to look at the um, particular way that Pascal fits into um, this broader um, problem of spirit coming to self-consciousness and truth within the phenomenology. And I'd like to begin by thanking everybody who has supported the channel. I remind you, you can join us at the School for Bin Text for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So as we now transition from little a to little b, we must recall that Hegel had already introduced this pair of sections in Lecture 25 by noting the irony that the second world of faith, which is the one we're dealing with in this video, um, is indeed a response to the problem of cultural alienation, which had defined the first world, but only ends up generating its own recursive alienation from this alienation, which doubly negates nature by going beyond the um, admittedly arbitrary cultural conventions of the first world to instead the full-blown solipsism 
of a world of pure thought, populated only by its own personal beliefs, which even it cannot rationally understand, but can only have faith that they are true. Ironically, the 17th century French figure par excellence to exemplify this phase was, as I mentioned, none other than Pascal, the great mathematician who realized for perhaps that very reason the uselessness of trying to mix faith and reason too much. Well, in paragraph 526, we find that the specific catalyst which drove consciousness into this world of its own beliefs was the discovery of the vanity of the first world, but not only in the sense of uh, discovering the uh, moral vanity of, say, wealth and political institutions, but also the discovery of their complete lack of foundations, even on a deeper metaphysical level. You might recall that the last section had ended with Diderot's Ramos' nephew speaking from the standpoint of wealth itself in order to reveal what those who had fallen under the spell of greed could not see, that far from being the ultimate fetishized substance whose fullness of being sets all other political activities in motion as something of a secularized first cause or primary mover, wealth is instead split to its very core by internal contradictions which make it, strictly speaking, a non-thing. This deconstruction of gold transitively spreads out to similarly deconstruct every other cultural construct in that first world, for we had seen in the previous section that even the political power of the king consisted in nothing more than his ability to allocate shares of state power to inflate one special interest group over another with specific amounts of gold serving as the common denominator to measure how much power any one person held within that society. In a certain sense, then, the king's only real power of state is the coercive absorption of gold from the citizens to the state through taxation. Now that consciousness has succeeded in seeing through this illusion, though, its disillusionment with worldly institutions leads it to have a reflective turn inwards back into its own mind. Paragraph 527 notes that consciousness finds that although it does indeed a discover, uh, it, it does indeed discover a second world which exists beyond the first world which it had left behind as a mere belief which has not yet reached the higher stage of religion proper, this second world simply um, is interpreted as a world which must lie beyond this one in the all too literal sense of being heaven. This heaven, though, is the kind of thing which consciousness can only have faith exists, because not only can it not, not prove its existence rationally, it cannot even really understand what heaven is on a properly notional level. More specifically, Hegel notes that because this faith is a mode of thought, but not one which has actually reached the level of notional thinking, it merely thinks this beyond through the lower level picture thinking of doubling familiar earthly representations into their respective divine counterparts over there. For example, just as there is a plurality of separate persons in this world, so too is God now represented as the trio of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as three distinct persons. Hegel's own wording reads, since consciousness only has these thoughts, but as yet does not think them, they exist for consciousness in the form of picture thoughts, for it steps out of its actual world into pure consciousness, yet is itself generally still in the sphere of the actual world and its determinateness. Hegel goes on to note that such picture thinking of the beyond is only an immediate elevation of itself which still fails to fully accomplish its task because it fails to master the mediation of this movement, which is, of course, the mediation of notion. Hegel is also careful to note in paragraph 527 that whereas the Stoic's flight from the world into its own thought was purely formal, the faithful believer's flight from the world now also has a certain content, even beyond what we saw in the section immediately preceding this one. For whereas in section 26, good and bad, as you might recall, were purely abstract placeholders, which could just as easily be filled by any mutually exclusive objects if you just, you know, change the person doing the judging. Um, 
And because, of course, each one really just seemed to be a means to an end for the subject to evaluate whether X was like him or unlike him, well, for the faithful believer now, in contrast, good and bad have indeed been enriched with determinate content. For God slash heaven personifies the good, and hell slash Satan personify the bad in an all too clear sense. Paragraph 528 notes, then, that this faith also goes beyond the ancient Greek cult of the dead, for even in positing a certain belief in the afterlife, there was no projection in that phase of a beyond, for the dead family member would still remain grounded in his earthly family and would intervene in order to serve their interests here on earth even after he had passed over into death. Paragraph 590, uh, 529 we find in contrast that once again Pascal exemplifies this transition from ancient Greek understanding of the afterlife to modern faith in heaven because he realized the vanity not only of wealth and worldly political institutions but also the vanity of clever worldly thinking. Interestingly, Pascal understood the dangers of trying to prove one's religious beliefs with the power of the human intellect alone all too well precisely because he was one of the great mathematicians of the 17th century. One might perhaps compare this to Ted Kaczynski's similar warning that pure mathematics is, at its deepest level, nothing more than an empty game of moving symbols around. We must remember that Kaczynski's own um, advisor when he got his PhD in pure mathematics at the University of Michigan noted that Kaczynski's dissertation was so difficult that only perhaps 10 people in North America could have understood it. Yet for that very reason, he understood that you do not have a fetishized um, uh, pl uh, plentitude of being there. You just have the um, illusion of being and the reality of nothingness, as we just um, realized was the case for the worldly power of wealth as well. Well, in the 19th century, Kierkegaard, the thinker of faith par excellence of the post-Hegelian era, had also turned this formula back on Hegel himself by warning that if one's happiness is at stake, especially one's eternal happiness, relying on any system of rational thought, even the complete rational system of Hegel's phenomenology, extending far beyond this particular section of the book, well, that would still be unwise, for one can only make a leap of faith in which even blatant logical absurdity does not bother one, for the entire point at this level is paradox. For example, paradoxes such as whether God is so all-powerful that he could create a boulder so large that even he himself could not lift it, do not prove that God does not exist, says Kierkegaard. This only proves that one is not dealing with the highest level or the final result of a single, internally consistent logical system, in which case one could simply arrive at the solution by following so many generic, universally repeatable steps in an algorithm of thinking. Instead, paradoxes like this one only reveal a need to make a leap of faith out of systematic thinking altogether, to arrive at a truth which by definition lacks the very possibility of universal comprehension. His own example in Fear and Trembling of Abraham's need to violate the universal ethical law by killing his own son um, is an all too um, <laughs> shocking confirmation of just this same principle. Well, to return to Pascal, just a few brief samples from his unfinished, posthumously published collection of fragments titled Pensée will reveal a similar um, conclusion, but in a much more cryptic and obscure manner. For example, in the 20th fragment of my copy of pa uh, Pascal's Pensée, um, he warns that the um, attempt to use the intellect to embark on a search for truth, even in the mundane sense of just trying to find certainty, will inevitably lead one to find the exact opposite. Surprisingly, one does not only find more uncertainty in the outer world which one tries to understand, one finds even more uncertainty in the reflective attempt to understand oneself. The more I search for my own happiness, for example, the more I end up finding the discomforting truth of nothing except death.
Far beyond the illusion of an idealized future in which my hopes and dreams are fulfilled lies the sad fact that the only outcome which is really guaranteed for my life is that I will eventually die. Similarly, in fragment 23, I quote him verbatim um, as saying, all these contradictions which used to keep me away from the knowledge of um, religion um, are what have led me soonest to the true religion. In fragment 29, Pascal explicitly commented on the conflict between faith and reason by noting that um, an ultimate conclusion is unreachable in either for one would either have to move upward to the status of a god or downward to the status of a beast to transcend the kinds of limitations on the um, intellect of man which prevent him from solving either definitively. We might say similarly today that you'd either have to become a disembodied spirit, like in the platonic sense, or you'd have to become a um, completely lifeless machine in the Kurzweilian sense of supercomputers which can solve problems um, like even including death. Um, you'd have to become one of those, perhaps, to um, uh, transcend limitations of the human condition, which, of course, are exactly the thing that you're really trying to understand in that search for truth. Well, finally, in fragment 31, uh, 30 to 31, Pascal revealed the ego's esteem of itself to be a total fraud, for far from being the power of reason itself, as it prides itself on holding that status, we are instead already so mad that only more madness can break the spell and lead one to finally grasp something like happiness. In this case, more madness dissolves not just the illusion of my own greatness, but also the illusion of any temporary victory of order over chaos in this world. I find only the vanity of wealth, political institutions, etc. So the only path for happiness is the one that leads out of this fallen world to the second world of, of course, the faith in my own beliefs. Obviously, we could go on with this much further, but I think that you get the point by now. To return to Hegel, in paragraph 529, he noted the irony that Pascal, um, his arrival in the phenomenology is inextricably tied up with the arrival of Voltaire, his exact opposite as the skeptical non-believer who uses reason alone to try to reveal the supposed ridiculousness and lack of foundation of that second world of belief, too. For example, Voltaire's Candide challenged Leibniz's claim that we must be living in the best of all possible worlds because God was powerful enough to create any world, but he was also good enough to grant us the least bad among all of the other alternatives. But Candide um, shows us instead a world characterized by so many serious catastrophes that, of course, only the most naive could possibly believe that this is the best possible world. At any rate, as I mentioned in Lecture 25, neither faith nor reason really can hope to win this debate, for each one can only even define itself through making reference to its other. Reason is what you get if you go beyond the limits of mere faith, as Voltaire tries to show us, while faith is what you get if you go beyond the limits of mere reason, as Pascal tries to show us. In this section, Hegel also goes on to note that this conflict is ultimately a disagreement over how to define the universal, for whereas faith projects the stable and coherent essence of heaven as the ultimate definition of the universal, reason, in contrast, defines the universal simply as its own negativity or its own uh, process of deconstructing any seemingly stable X which it happens to encounter. Each of these is, of course, partially right, but also, for that very reason, wrong. For faith gives you a content of the universal without the notional mediation which goes beyond the picture thinking it tries to understand heaven with, and reason gives you the abstract form of negation without the content of determinate negation. Paragraph 530 notes, however, that we must be dealing with determinate negation in this particular phase of the phenomenology, for one's flight from the world 
still contains and includes the same world which it negates. Paragraph 531, we find that the believer's picture thinking misses its own point by projecting, say, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as three distinct persons akin to the persons of this world, failing to see them as giving rise to one another through an ongoing logical process. Paragraph 534, we find that this picture thinking also leads him to negate the skeptic's reason in a merely abstractly negative manner, simply refusing to use the intellect for any purpose except to mindlessly obey, in which case one is not thinking, one is not using the intellect really at all. While well, paragraph 535 reveals the obvious fact that such faith remains all the more tied up with its enemy reason, the more it tries to oppose it. Paragraph 537 reveals that reason really is no better. Reason also inevitably secularizes, um, for example, faith's evangelical duty to spread the gospel to all within the world by taking up the pseudo-evangelical duty to spread reason to all the earth. By pronouncing the pious imperative, be for yourselves what you all are in yourselves, which is, of course, to be reasonable, it takes up the crusade of a universal enlightenment, which will define the next 